Stay Free with me, Russell Brand. Hello, welcome to Stay Free with Russell Brand. Today I'm joined by Dr. Alina Chan, a molecular biologist at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. Also, Alina wrote the author of Viral, The Search of the Origin of COVID-19. Uh, Alina, you've received death threats for saying publicly how coronavirus-19 began. How did COVID-19 begin? So all of the evidence right now is not this positive. It's not direct evidence. So no one can say where this pandemic started. We just have to investigate. What area of investigation have you pursued that has led you to receive death threats? And what do you personally believe is the, uh, uh, were the original conditions for the virus? I was one of the earliest scientists to publicly say that we should investigate a lab-based origin of this virus, and that unfortunately threw me into the spotlight. I, I became a kind of a lightning rod for this topic because very few scientists were willing to publicly say that, hey, this might have come from a lab accident, but I was willing to say it. Uh, this was back in early 2020 when people still considered this a conspiracy theory or even a right-wing conspiracy theory or racist conspiracy theory. So um, that kind of singled me out for... I think a lot of abuse by, by, by people who believe that this was racist and a conspiracy theory. Why was this theory considered racist and conspiratorial when to me as a person that's not studied molecular biology at Harvard, it would seem that if gain of function research on bat coronaviruses was taking place in Wuhan and the pandemic began in Wuhan, that along with the obvious area of inquiry that's a wet market god knows what goes on in those places why you wouldn't simultaneously <laughs> investigate the laboratory where gain of function research takes place why was it not investigated in the first place do you imagine i think the issue was quickly politicized when some republicans made statements about it uh, they were just talking about accidents, by the way. They weren't even talking about bioweapons or any, anything that nefarious. Uh, but because of the media reporting on this issue, it quickly became polarized. And people who hate Republicans, you know, did just like they used the, the rhetoric that they used to, that this was racist, that it was a conspiracy, this anti-scientific. Um, and because of that, uh, I think it, it really blocked an inquiry, uh, blocked the public from asking questions. And in the scientific arena, there were some scientists who had a secret meeting in, in early 2020 uh, where they said, okay, it, it looks like it might have come from a lab, but then they wrote a paper saying, telling everyone else, no, it's a conspiracy theory. If, uh, there's no way this came from a lab. So scientists were also blocked from asking questions about this origin. Is it true that you were, uh, that you were accused of filthy behavior and a basic lack of academic ethics? Is that true? Yeah, I think that came from... The was, global wasn't that times. A Chinese state, yeah, the Chinese state media report. Yeah, that 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 brought quite a few um, people, anonymous users on Twitter, coming and threatening me. Do you uh, have any reason to suspect, in particular, that a lab leak theory is more plausible than a natural origin? For example, the characteristics of the virus or the way that it has been adapted from its indigenous form in bats. Well, it's not just the characteristics of the virus, but even the information and the situation surrounding the emergence of this pand pandemic virus. So many of the signs of a natural spillover are missing. So when you look at SARS and MERS, SARS that came out in 2003 and MERS that, that repeatedly spilled over into, into people, uh, there are many telltale signs that those were natural spillovers. So you always find an infected animal close to the scene, <laughs> close to where there are early cases. And in this case, there, there are just none. So even though in early 2020, the Chinese government themselves, they told the public that this likely came from illegal wildlife at the market, they could not find any infected animals. And soon the Chinese CDC director came out and said that this market is likely a super spreader event. It was likely a person, a sick person who brought the virus in rather than a sick animal. Uh, there's also no evidence they've been looking but there's no evidence that there would be these type of SARS like viruses circulating in Wuhan which is in central China removed by more than a thousand miles from where the closest relatives to this pandemic virus came from so and if you look at the virus itself too um, it was just ready from day one to, to cause a pandemic it it did not require much adaptation and it has this very special feature called the furin cleavage site which is what makes it a pandemic virus so without this special feature there's no way it could have caused a pandemic. And uh, last year, 
a, a research proposal was leaked showing that scientists in that city of Wuhan had a pipeline for putting this special feature into SARS-like viruses they collected in nature. So you put all these coincidences together and, and the knowledge that it's not very likely for this type of virus to naturally spill over in Wuhan city. And it, it really looks like this might have come from a lab accident. Does it also support this theory, the fact that the Wuhan lab have not been forthcoming with cooperation and data sharing? Quite problematic because this, this lab, which collaborates with US partners, namely the Equal Health Alliance, their whole mandate was to collect all these viruses, study them, and use that to predict pandemics, to, to figure out how to, to predict where pandemics might arise and how to respond to them. And yet, when the pandemic happened in their city, these top virus hunters, these top like origins trackers, they, they, couldn't, this, they couldn't tell where this virus had come from, so they, they suddenly forgot all their skills. They suddenly became incompetent. Uh, they, they failed to point out that special feature in, in, the, in the virus and they refused to share their data. So this whole database, this whole, all the projects you know, funded millions of dollars to, to collect and study viruses. Suddenly they said, oh, we can't share any of this data with you and we're not gonna share our lab protocols with you. It was left to, to internet sloops and independent scientists and analysts like myself to point out that, hey, these guys have the closest relatives to SARS-CoV-2 in their lab, collected from a cave where, where people had sickened with a mysterious pneumonia. And they've been just collecting thousands of samples over the years without publishing this data uh, from places where they could have found more SARS-2-like viruses and put in those special features. And they've been doing all this work at a super low biosafety level, so a level that could not contain SARS-CoV-2. So it's just this pattern of withholding information and, and, and just, just going against the whole mandate of, of trying to protect us against pandemics. If it were proven that it was as a result of an accidental lab leak, what consequences would there likely be that people might like to avoid? For example, who would be culpable? What would be the financial implications? How would it um, damage public trust in gain-of-function research and perhaps even trust in the pharmaceutical industry and the regulatory bodies more generally? So I think it's important to point out that in the first place, asking whether this pandemic might have started from a lab is not anti-science. I'm a scientist and, and there are many other scientists who are really determined to find out how this started. Mainly because if it did come from a lab, there's many things we can do to make research safer and more transparent. Uh, but if we don't even investigate, if you're afraid of going there, that means that the research keeps going on <laughs> and it's uh, not safer and it's not more transparent. And that means that we could have more outbreaks on uh, unfortunately, another large pandemic. Um, so it's really disturbing to see that the NIH has given the Eco Health Alliance, so the US collaborators of the Wuhan lab, more money to do the same type of research that might have started this pandemic, but in six different Southeast Asian countries instead of China. Why do you think the NIH has given further funding to the Eco Health Alliance? Why would they do that when the risks would seem to be um, evident? Or not if the risks, you know, I don't know about the risks because, of course, nothing's been proven. But mm -hmm. why, 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 why is it that they keep giving grants to this kind of experimentation? Is it very profitable? Is it very important? Is it a problem that we're likely to be facing at scale? Why? This would be complete speculation because until they release the reviewer comments on, on those grant applications, we don't know why they keep giving the Equal Health Alliance more money. So... Uh, for me, it's, it's very problematic that they keep doubling down. It, it sounds like they are unwilling to face the, the possibility that this might have come from a lab. And, and frankly, even if this pandemic did not start from a lab, those activities that the Equal Health Alliance are engaging in are inherently risky. So this idea of going out there, searching for viruses in wildlife and people, and people who are in the wildlife trade, they're searching for things that could cause outbreaks. <laughs> and they bring these back to their labs or send it to labs around the world. And who knows what people are doing with it. Sometimes they might do accidental gain of function research, which they have shown in their, in their work with the Wuhan scientists that they accidentally enhanced these viruses to a point where they, they were much more lethal, so deadlier in, in humanized mice. So it's, it's very problematic that this work keeps going on without showing the world how they have made it safer or more transparent. Even as a methodology, it seems somewhat irresponsible to conduct experimentation that at every level exposes us to potential risk. It doesn't seem that it would be regarded as sensible to bring a convicted murderer into your home 
in order to practice your security measures. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's a good analogy. I mean, it, it's in the first place when you're out in the field, when you're out in caves, or when you're out in clinics and looking for people who are sick. It's very hard to to maintain a biosafety level that can protect you against something like SARS, against a pandemic pathogen. So. There's exposure at all points, whether you're, you're catching a bat, whether you're talking to a patient, someone who has an unknown disease, or whether you're bringing it back to the lab. And, and there's this unknown virus that you're tinkering with. You don't know what it's capable of. Um, you don't know what biosafety level to use. And so every step of this research pathway has a good chance of, of causing accidental infection. Given the way that the story broke, at the emergence of the pandemic, the uh, document that Peter Daszak organized, signed by 26 scientists, six of whom received funding from EcoHealth Alliance, and the sort of what seemed to me to be a broad consensus in the media that the natural origin theory was the only one worth considering. Do you feel, Alina, that the media potentially corroborate uh, stories that are emerge that are beneficial to one particular narrative? Yes, I, I think that's true in this case. So uh, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of misinformation being spread by the central and, and left-leaning media in recent months. So for example, you might have seen like CNN interviews or The Guardian claiming that there's that two recent studies showed that there were infected animals at the market. So this couldn't be anything further from the truth. There were no infected animals at that market. None of the animal samples there uh, tested positive for the virus. That's shocking. And when the CDC, when the Chinese CDC appeared at that market on January 1st, 2020, they did not find any live animals. So it's very problematic that this sort of false information is being spread by, by uh, the media that most people trust. Ought there be more insistence on transparency regarding such complex and potentially dangerous issues? Does it not seem that as people like even Anthony Fauci have somehow supported one set of data over others and pushed one narrative and prevented actively the idea of a lab leak theory being properly investigated, for example, those early communications with people that put forward the lab leak theory that were sort of quashed. And I feel like that there was, if not a cover up, certainly curation of the data. Yeah, so as many of your viewers probably know, uh, the, the top scientific leaders, uh, Dr. Fauci, and, and even in the UK, in, in the US and the UK, they had this private teleconference call in early 2020, and they were really worried that this pandemic might have started from a virus that was accidentally enhanced in the lab. And they were worried that that research might have been co-funded by the US and the UK through the NIH or through the Wellcome Trust. So they... On that call, they were really worried. <laughs> but, but two days later, the people who worried about lab origin were, were trying to shut down other scientists by saying, no, we know that this wasn't genetically engineered. And then soon they put out this paper saying that, yeah, we can, based on the science, we can, we can say that this was not from a lab. Um, and in, in emails that were uh, you know, obtained through the Freedom of Information Act, uh, through Republican transcripts, they, they showed that these, these leaders, these scientific leaders, they were really worried about... Uh, even the idea that this might have come accidentally from a lab. So they were doing everything they could, citing this paper that the teleconference call uh, produced again and again to the media, trying to tell people that the science is settled. I'm personally not a Republican person. I suppose that's irrelevant because I'm English and unable to vote in the United States. But my feeling is, is that the reason that the Wuhan lab leak theory from a number of angles has not been properly investigated and explored is because it challenges certain fundamental tenets. The, the commodification of medicine, trust in the state, the ability for the state to regulate and control behavior at an extraordinary level, the ability of the state to collaborate with big tech and capture information, the ability of the state in conjunction with the media to control a narrative. Because it was a truly global event, it provides a lens through which we can examine many facets of power. 
I f this is just my feeling as a, an uninformed observer. What do you think as a molecular biologist? Well, as a scientist, I, I think that this issue has a lot of ramifications for the scientific community and, and it can really hurt science and, and trust in science. Watch entire episodes on demand for free at rumble forward slash Russell Brand.